This is it, the final verdict. We've tested one core with one thread, one core with hyper threading, a triple core scenario, but this, this is gold. For those of you tuning in for the first time, welcome aboard. We've been disabling cores and hyper threads in an effort to scrutinize CPU core scaling in modern and popular AAA titles, the only exception being CSGO. You can start here if you're interested in watching from the beginning, or stick around for everything to be thrown at you all at once, although there are a few pretty funny parts in part one. Let's quickly review the test bench. It's that right there. It's my own personal rig. For every scenario you're about to see, 16GB of DDR4 clocked to 3000MHz was used, not the RAM you're seeing now, mind you, an ASUS Strix ROG GTX 1070 running at stock, and an Intel Core i7-6700K whose cores and hyper-threading capabilities will be enabled and disabled starting from one core and one thread, all the way up to four cores and eight threads. The CPU has also been held at 4.4GHz throughout for the sake of consistency. Remember, we're doing this purely from a scientific standpoint. Manipulating any other variables in this experiment would be pointless, as the only thing we're trying to do here is determine the number of cores necessary to game at a fairly demanding resolution, 1440p. In-game settings were liberally tuned as you'll see in the graphs. It's about that time actually. Here they are. First on the list, as usual, the well-balanced PC port GTA 5. At max settings and no anti-aliasing, to spare the GPU of unwanted stress, we see a fairly odd trend. Yes, as core count increases, the frame rate does as well, but that's as far as it goes. Hyperthreading really doesn't help out Grand Theft Auto. I first noticed this in my i3 vs i5 video that you can check out right here. Long story short, it's the physical cores that matter in a game like this. By the way, the C stands for core and the T stands for thread, so if the thread count is double the core count, it means that hyperthreading was enabled in that scenario. Now then, jumping from, say, a Pentium to an i3 won't make much of a difference in a game like Grand Theft Auto V. I've actually confirmed that with those physical processors as well. And yes, I know level 3 cache varies, but it won't significantly impact overall frame rates in a well-optimized game. Remember, in this case, it's constant, as is clock speed for that matter, but the CPUs these scenarios represent will vary slightly. CPU clock speed doesn't change very much in-game either, believe it or not, and I've proven that in a series right here. On to City Skylines, notably very CPU intensive. It definitely shows. And you know what else shows? The frame rate increase when hyperthreading is enabled, hence the rather linear trend here. What's likely going on here is City Skylines is pushing a large amount of parallel data to the CPU, in which case an adept scheduler in a hyperthreaded environment would surely help. The more threads, the more data can be processed simultaneously. If GTA 5 isn't hyperthreading optimized, it won't know how to send more information to the dispatch and schedulers. Cities is doing quite the opposite, simply pushing as much data as needed through the pipelines to be later processed and rendered by the GPU. Ashes of the Singularity is very bizarre in another way. Here, essentially, any core count above 2 is ideal. What you're seeing towards the top is something often referred to as the Law of Diminishing Returns. We discussed it extensively in economics. At some point, adding another stimulant, in this case a physical core, changes almost nothing, and it shows up like a brick wall at the 3 core boundary. Another interesting note here is how much better the hyper-threaded triple core simulation performed over the quad core non-hyper-threaded scenario. When a game is optimized in such a way that it benefits from hyper-threads, a CPU CPU with more of them should in theory trump a CPU with less of them past a certain point, regardless of how many physical cores there are. We didn't see this in cities, but we do definitely see it here. Let's throw it back for a second. CSGO. How do you think this one will react when more cores are thrown at it? Well, believe it or not, a lot like GTA 5. In fact, in a few instances, particularly above the three core boundary, hyperthreading appears to hurt the overall frame rate. The reasons range far and wide, but one theory involves parallelism. If CSGO sends information to the CPU in a linear fashion, then enabling hyperthreading will only stress the decoder and instruction pipeline. At this point, I really can't avoid it, let's use the Linus analogy. If hyperthreading is a bit like eating with two hands, as he says in his Tech Quickie video, but you're chewing and swallowing at a rate slower than either hand is preparing food, you're just wasting energy using two hands instead of one, which might even be able to accomplish the task faster now that you're not using additional energy on the second hand. It's an oversimplification, yes, but if the scheduler has data ready to be processed before the core demands it without hyperthreading, then what good is hyperthreading? We don't see this trend in too many modern games, but CSGO is definitely a victim here. You could even make the case for GTA 5. Check out the full hyperthreading video from TechWiki in this video's description. 
Let's move on. Total War Warhammer. Boy, is this one strange. So it's a very CPU dependent game, pretty much like every Total War game in existence, but this one falls into that category for a different reason. It doesn't need many cores, it just needs a few fast ones. Check this out. The difference between a single hyper-threaded core and a full-fledged i7-6700K in terms of averages equates to just a couple of frames. Sure, minimums are significantly lower, we see these flatten out at the three core boundary, but the average frame rate trend is a testament to different strategies when it comes to game coding. Total War took a different route than most, that's for sure. Last up is Battlefield 1 Beta. I had to test this one first chronologically because it recently closed for the upcoming official release. As it's a relatively new game, these scores are subject to change, and my benchmarking methods were admittedly not the smoothest, but again, above the three core boundary, there isn't much of a difference in terms of neither minimums nor averages. Stay tuned for revisited benchmarks once the full game does go on sale. So what'd you think of the grand finale, folks? Did anything catch you by surprise? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you thought it was cool. Give it a thumbs down if you feel the complete opposite, or if you have no idea what you're doing here, be sure to click the subscribe button if you haven't already and stay tuned for, I don't really know what I'm going to do next, maybe something about the iPhone SE and the Apple Watch because I've already done something about the Mac. I also have a few head-to-head -head mashups between the MacBook and things like the XPS 13 and the Razer Blade Stealth. If I can get my hands on either of those, I'll definitely have those videos uploaded. This is Science Studio, stay tuned, thanks for learning with us.